Hi, I am Carolyn Hunt. I am an assistant professor of elementary education literacy in the School of Teaching and Learning. And today I'll be talking to you about research related to my latest URG um, entitled Picturing Poverty, Exploring Visual Representations of Social Class in Education Magazines. Um, I began working on this study um, as a result of seeing this cover of the Education Magazine reading today for the first time. It led me to think about how and why we represent um, economically disadvantaged children and their families in certain ways. So the questions for this study are, how are issues of social class and socioeconomic status represented in photographic images within Education Magazine articles focusing on literacy instruction? And how are audiences, in this case teachers, positioned by these representations? To do this, I drew on um, data um, across several um, magazines intended for practicing educators, um, such as Literacy Today, formerly known as a Reading Today, Educational Leadership, and Ed Week. All of these magazines are intended to be reader friendly, they're for practitioners, and they often include, um, the articles in the issues often include um, a lot of photographs and other visual information. Inclusion criteria for the study, an article needed to explicitly mention social class in some way, um, be related to a topic of literacy instruction or literacy practices, and contain at least one visual representation of students, families, or communities. Um, for the larger study, as I said, I looked at three um, different education magazines. For the current study, I focused on Literacy Today, which was formerly entitled Reading Today, and I focused on just one issue the February, March 2012 issue of Reading Today. I focused on this issue because it was the only issue that related specifically to um, issues of social class. The issue was entitled Overcoming the Impact of Poverty on Learning. Um, and even though it was an issue um, themed around poverty, there were only two articles in this issue that met the inclusion criteria. So this um, work that I'm presenting today, I focused um, and did very close analysis of the five photos from those two articles plus the cover of that issue. To analyze these photos, I used a critical visual approach, um, which according to um, Jillian Rose's work, takes images seriously, meaning that you pay close attention to um, the components of a, an image, in this case photographs, um, thinks about the social conditions and effects of visual objects and considers one's own way of looking at images. This diagram is taken from Rose's work and it shows the three sites of images that are often considered by researchers. So we have the side of the image itself, um, where we're thinking about what is the composition of the photo, what are the visual effects, what are the visual meanings. We have the side of audiencing, which is thinking about who views the images and why. Um, and then the side of production, which considers how photos are made, what the genre is, who made them, why they made them, and for whom they were made. Um, generally, um, researchers into images um, will focus more heavily on one site of uh, images. Um, for this study, I decided to take a more holistic view of photo analysis to give me a broader picture of what's happening in the photos um, and how they're being taken up. And so I tried to focus on all three sites of the image and to do that require drawing on a variety of theoretical and methodological bases, um, such as semiology, and to explore the side of the image and how constructions of social difference are articulated through the working of signs and images themselves. I use psychoanalysis framework um, to consider the side of audiencing, um, ways of seeing and interpreting the images, 
Um, psychoanalysis also encourages an exploration of how subjects and viewers are positioned by images and which positions are available as the result of the photographic qualities, such as distance, camera position, points of view, and focus. Um, I thought about things like what sort of gaze is being encouraged um, by the elements of the photo. And then um, post-structuralist concepts of discourse allowed me to pay attention to the side of production and thinking about how power and knowledge are genealog genealogically constructed through images across space and over time. So I devised a set of questions um, that are closely developed after um, Jillian Rose's methods in her book, Visual Methodologies, but I also added a few of my own questions based on the work of others. And there's a lot of overlap between the questions in terms of which site um, they're helping me understand, um, but for simplicity's sake, I've um, categorized them here. So for the side of the image, I asked questions such as what's being shown in the picture, what are the components of the image? What do they signify? How does the photo use color, lighting? Um, what are the vantage points and the focus, focal points of the images? For the side of audience, I'm looking at where's the viewer's eye meant to be drawn to in the image and, and why? Um, How is the image framed? And what interpretations are encouraged by that framing? Um, what are possible emotional or affective embodied responses to the image and so on? For the side of production, I considered um, what the genre of the photo was, what knowledges are being deployed, what knowledges are absent. Um, in other words, whose knowledge counts, um, whose uh, perspectives are represented or not represented in the photo. And then I also looked at how the written text that accompanied the photo guided the image's interpretation. What became very interesting to me as I looked at the photos and started thinking about them in terms of the site of production was that they were obviously all stock photos. And so I started to wonder, how do I know this is a stock photo? There must be something about the genre of stock photos um, that is very clear. And so that led me into reading about stock photos. I actually found that there are not a lot of studies exploring stock photos. I think that is probably because they're seen as a lot of fluff, just there's nothing really there. Um, but I actually think that's what makes the stock photos so interesting. One of the few researchers I found that has spent a lot of time thinking about um, stock photos is Frosch. Um, and he considers stock photos a code without a message. Um, which means that they're meant to be very vague, but at the same time able to convey a lot of different messages, and that these also make them very generic images that are both reflective and constructive of cultural stereotypes. Um, and he talked about understanding stock photos in terms of their genre, their concept, and their catalog. So as a genre, um, Stock photos have to have a common framework of meaning to draw on. Um, and also, um, they need to be very vague. And so when we're thinking about genre and image, we're thinking about what should the photo look like. So if we think about stock photos, often they're very, um, there are not a lot of details in the photos. And they usually have a white background, although not always. They're more likely to be photos of happy people, since they're often used to sell things and so on. Concept is thinking about um, how to sell it to a client. So the photographers who are creating stock photos need to think about what the image might be used for and what it needs to mean and how it can be again, vague enough so that it would be purchased in lots of different contexts by lots of different clients. And then the catalog he refers to as the metaphor machine. And this is asking how should the photo be categorized for greatest consumption? And so a stock photo is generally listed um, with a large number of tags um, to help clients find photos to use. And the photographer assigns the tags to the photos um, in order to encourage consumption of the photographs.
And so then looking at how the photos were cataloged can give us information about how and why they were produced. So um, here are the photos from the first article, actually photo number one um, of the little boy with his head on his knees um, is from the cover of the issue. And then photos two and three are from an article entitled, What Children Living in Poverty Do Bring to School Strong Oral Skills. And the predominant heading in that article was, Let Them Talk. So I will read some descriptions of what I noticed about these photos through going through the analysis questions that I shared with you. So photo one appeared on the cover of the February, March 2012 issue of Reading Today and shows a white boy wearing a white t-shirt, ripped jeans and no shoes, crouching near a dirty concrete wall with his arms crossed on his knees and his head resting on his arms. His face is not visible. We only see the top of his head and his light brown unkempt hair. The title, Overcoming the Impact of Poverty on Learning, anchors the interpretation of the image so that the viewer understands that the boy is sad and alone because he lives in poverty. The dirty concrete wall and floor, the child's bare feet and ripped jeans indicate dirtiness, abandonment, and lack of care, which are assumed to be fundamental conditions of poverty. Furthermore, the photo and title index discourses of individualism and bootstrapping, the aim is not to eradicate poverty or to ameliorate lived conditions, but for children to learn in spite of the material consequences of poverty. Photos two and three that you see here appeared in the article. Photo two shows a white boy kneeling next to the graffiti wheel of a truck in what appears to be an abandoned lot. He has a forlorn expression with a furrowed brow and sad blue eyes. Photo three is of a white adolescent girl sitting on the ground with her knees drawn up to her chest. She is leaning against a wall with weathered shingles, and she gazes off into the distance with a hint of sadness and worry on her face. The graffiti, the abandoned lot, the weathered shingles work together to indicate a community in decline. The children's postures and expressions suggest isolation and a lack of safety. Although the article emphasizes the oral language strengths, such as narrative skills, of economically disadvantaged children, the photograph shows students who are isolated and alone and erases the rich storytelling environments of their families. These photos encourage a pitiful gaze from teachers and reify stereotypes about poor rural white students. This next set of photos is from an article entitled Educating Children of Poverty. School action alone is not enough. Prominent subheadings within this article were community efforts, an indispensable ingredient, and the Arlington experience. These photos show primarily students of color participating in school activities. Photo four features a smiling black female teacher reading to a small group of students who are sitting cross-legged in a circle on the floor in front of her. The stock photo database labels the students as African-American, Hispanic, and white. Photo five focuses on a black boy who is working individually at his desk, pencil in hand and eyes on his work. In these photos, the children not represented as alone or sad, Instead, they are understood as representing students living in poverty because of the context of the article and common discourses that conflate poverty and race. Although the article focuses on the importance of community efforts to attenuate the effects of poverty, these photos index traditional schooling. Um, for example, the pencils, the desks in rows, the book, the chalkboards, the flashcards, and emphasize the role of the school. For example, focusing on the teacher in photo four. These school-based fo photos take attention away from the goal of partnering with families and communities. So something I noticed in both of the articles is that the photos were actually presenting a message that was in opposition to the intended message of the article. So in this article, the argument is that community and parent engagement is important for student success, but then the photos are focusing attention on the school. Um, in the previous article, um, the focus was on um, appreciating students' strong oral skills, but then the photos showed them alone and not talking to anybody, um, which is interesting. So from looking at um, all of these photos, we can see that white middle-class understandings of poverty and race, which are encoded with a long history of deficit thinking, um, were prominent across the five photos. 
poverty as an embodied experience was either represented by white dirtiness and isolation or by black or brown skin. This deficit perspective um, may serve to erase the experiences of those living within conditions of poverty. And it fails to recognize the diverse joys, resources, and strengths of families and communities. Um, the photos when read in the context of articles about poverty encourage teachers to look on children with a pitiful, scornful gaze or to position themselves as saviors who should be saving the students from their conditions of poverty. So some practical implications for this work. I think that we need to pay closer attention to how we choose photos to accompany articles. Um, I don't know what the process for choosing photos was for these articles, but I would imagine that the um, authors did not intend for these um, photo accompaniments because they contradict the message of the article so much. Um, and so I'm not sure as authors how much control we always have over that, um, but we could advocate for having more of a control for that. But also we tend to use photos in our other more informal work that we do. And so I think it's important to think about um, how we are using photos within blog posts, PowerPoints, and in educational spaces, and to encourage teacher candidates to be careful um, about how they are choosing photos as well, and to think closely about what kinds of messages they are sending about children and teachers and families and communities when they choose a particular photo. And also, I think this work um, demonstrates that critical visual literacies are important. Um, communication is increasingly visual. Um, I think that we often, um, but when we focus on critical literacies, we tend to focus on print literacies. I think visual literacies are also very important to include within that. Research implications, I think that there's potential um, for this holistic view of visual analysis that I used. Uh, because it allowed me to look across discipline in order to deepen my understanding of the photos and have a, a broader understanding of um, how cultural meanings are produced for the images. So I think further work in that direction could be useful. Um, I also think it could be valuable to trace these stock photos over time and space um, to understand um, in a broader sense how cultural meanings are taken up or resisted. And so I've begun doing that work. I'm looking at how these photos and other photos from the study are used in different contexts across the internet, which has been really interesting work. Um, so thank you for listening to me today.